Press right. I think they're three or four hundred of those. Depends on where you're shopping, buddy. <laughs> That's flaming. That's the angle on the dangle there, old Skippy. Today, you will get my honest and genuine reaction trying one of these babies. Oh, yeah. That's what's in here, too. I've never had one. I've held out. No, they're good. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Ready? Popping. Popping tops. Caramel vanilla. Coffee time. Ah. Oh. Don't go too fast now. There's 300 milligrams in there. The only hack I have for making content is to be caffeinated. <laughs> That's this the only is, hack I have. Yeah, I, I That's agree. That's all I got. I agree. I almost always save some kind of caffeinated drink before right before I turn that camera on. Like, give yeah. me a little stimulant, get my heart rate up a little bit, get my adrenaline going just a little, tiny bit. I've seen you shotgun one of these. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, in my uh, in my younger, more irresponsible days, I was the fastest uh, beer drinker in the West. <laughs> like I could drink really fast. Put that in a glass. It was just like <laughs> gone. I had a vision. Next. What do you call those things? Um, I had a vision, the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we're sitting here one evening. It's kind of late or whatever. Yep. Maybe we've had a couple of too many beers or whatever. Mm -hmm. That has happened you good? time or two. <laughs> not, not you and I, though. No, not you and I yet. No, no, and I don't really... I'll get you tied up. I don't really do that to... Uh, it's very rare, but... Yeah, no, maybe we had a couple or whatever, feeling all loose. Hold on a second. So you don't, you don't really do that, so do we need to have a drunken podcast once? We my buddy, my buddy Stacy yeah. said I was, he was really disappointed that we haven't been at least slightly <laughs> inebriated yet on our podcast. Yeah, we should have one. Okay. One to be fair. Well, uh, I talked to Brandon a little bit ago, and he's coming over here to get something. BMAC? Yeah. Our dude? Yeah, he's picking up, uh, oh, I don't remember if it was from one of his hunts or something. Yeah, he's picking up his stag antlers. Yeah, he's picking up his stag antlers and doing a road trip. So I imagine that would probably be the appropriate uh, whiskey cigar edition, right? Isn't that his thing? Yeah. A yeah. regular cigar or a Washington cigar? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that, that, is, that is not my bag. I would freak out. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, in, in honor of Brandon being on our podcast, we probably ought to do it a little bit like Brandon, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, he's got an open invitation. He knows that. I told him he's got a – Brandon, he's got a public whoop and waiting for him whenever he comes out here. Uh, up yeah. For the YouTubes, yeah. Yeah, well, I had a, a video idea for something uh, – to be named later if feasible, but um, it'd be cool to go out on the 3D course and do a little three-way comp. Yeah, totally. Be fun. Totally. Um, yeah. Back to my vision. So Vision. Here we are. Vision quest. What you got? We hear the door crack open. Crank. You know, this is an older door. And who walks through the door? PJ Riley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. PJ Riley, the world's no, greatest from Lancaster. Not happening. <laughs> he Guaranteed. cracks himself a cold one. And uh, he lines up at the table, and you and PJ Riley arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> Who wins? That's funny. Who wins? God, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not I want to like, see. I would pay I'm, to see that. I'm not like jacked in the arms. I would be paid to see that. I don't think he is either. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't look like he's uh, hitting the gym. At have you all, ever met? You know? Have you met? PJ? I have not met PJ in person. Dude, um, he seems like your. He seems like your goofy brother from the East Coast. Like uh, a little bit. Um, he's a little dry. Um, I mean, he's, he, he does a good job and what they're doing, like, obviously they've got hundred thousand subscribers and they're constantly putting out content. I think that's his, like between that and like hosting the archery events or whatnot that Lancaster puts on. I think that's like his full job. Yeah, no, it is. I think yeah. he's, yeah, I don't, he's I don't full, think full-time Lancaster or whatever. No, no, no. I mean like that part, like what you see is his full yeah. job. Like he doesn't have other responsibilities underneath the uh, Lancaster blanket. So, yeah. I mean, that's. Must be nice. <laughs> Must be um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Must be nice to not have to squeeze stuff like this in outside of the sixty-hour work week already. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, no. PJ, um, I, I don't. I almost say pioneered that. They did the you know? steel target challenge. Did you see I saw, that? I did see that. Yeah. 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 We need yeah. a steel target. Uh, working on. It. I'm trying to remember who the heck I talked to. It said they you could cut me, me one out. Yeah. And I we I talked still, a little bit about it. My brain is still struggling for the name of the person <laughs> who told me they could do that um, for me. But yeah, I'd I'd cut out a couple. Yeah, that'll Put be them cool. out there. 
Yeah. We probably put them at what 110 because they're at 100 or something like that. Just be a little farther. <laughs> yeah, because it's the west. We got to shoot a little farther in the west. Yeah. You know. Well, whatever they can do, I can the put east, them right we off. Can the definitely berm. do it just a little further. Yeah, I could put them right off the berm on Dude, the flat range. You versus PJ Riley on YouTube. Arm wrestling? <laughs> Not arm wrestling. Uh, big long bows, shooting deep. Think we can get them out here? No. No. Why, why would they do that? Well, for fun, man. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure they have fun. Yeah, well, <laughs> not to say they don't. If but. they'd like to, you never yeah. know. Yeah, you never know. Open invitation. We play nice with everybody. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, all love for people that are hunting, archery, you name it. Don't discriminate. Of course, because we're the minority. No, anybody. Why would you discriminate? Anybody that wants to go out in the woods and hunt something is your friend and your ally. Yeah. No matter what. Any or shoot your bow. Any format. Yeah. Any archer. Any kind. Any shooting sport. They are your ally, mm-hmm. not your enemy. They the uh, the groups that are against us want to make us enemies of each other because it's harder to speak up as a group if you're separated into seventeen different groups. That's the whole point. Yep. And you just rem- rem- always remember, anybody that's in the woods hunting, anybody that's doing a shooting sport, they are your brother, they are your sister, they are your ally, and need to be treated as such and with respect, even if they you don't agree with. What they do or yeah, how they do they're, it, they're still they're on your with team. A, you know, something yeah. that's not you're not into yeah. it. So what? They're out there with a legal tag in their pocket. Yeah, operating by the rules. Like, yeah, those are those are the people that we need to be united, not divided, for sure. Yeah, you can close that door. I think. Yeah, um, yeah, you gotta you gotta remember that because at the end of the day, if it ever gets down to voting, we need them to care about us as much as they as we need to care about them. It's important. You know, they've done a real. This state especially has done a really good job of taking a day from this user group and giving it to that user group and anybody paying attention to the regs knows that and they're doing that so you are upset at each other that's the yeah. point is so you can't speak up as a group yeah create a fight from within death by a thousand cuts like one, you one lose might one think, season here you lose another season there one might think other things in life are similar to that what's that <laughs> oh politics oh yeah no i know Creating it's a similar that, yeah. it's a similar plan man yeah yeah politics are <sighs> dicey Keep you but, fighting amongst each um, other so you don't fight against them. Yeah, that's why I'm so like I hate to see us lose anything, whether that's a you know spring bear hunt in Washington or a squirrel hunt in Kentucky. Like because once you lose it, it never comes back. Yeah, it's it's just like you know it's just like freedoms. If you give up a little bit of your freedom, you're never getting. That's that what's back. so scary. It's like yeah, that's yeah. What's so scary. Yeah, you got to be very cognizant of that and remember. Them trying to take a, a day from rifle should matter to you. Mm-hmm. Like you should care about that and say no, that's not right. You need to. They need to still have their seasons, and ideally have greater, longer seasons. But you know they have a, they have a. Oh, I don't know what the word is. It's um, they have a percentage. They have a percentage that they want to keep the success rate at. So the goal, at least in this state, is to sell as many tags and licenses as humanly possible while keeping the percentage rate at where they need it at. To ensure that only X amount of animals get harvested, but they're still generating the maximum amount of revenue possible. At least that's typically how this state takes it. Um, and it's it's unfortunate that it's just all about that. And that's why you see your seasons get shortened or the seasons get moved around to less opportune times to hunt because they still want you to be able to go out because they want you to buy a tag so they get their money, but they want you less likely to succeed. That's the whole point. Yeah. It's an ugly system, unfortunately. It's not perfect, but um, it's yeah, man, far from perfect. We were just talking about uh, maybe putting a little competitive shoot on the schedule this summer. Yeah, yeah, I think we just straightened that out today. A little, uh, yeah, I've never actually f- put my money into a competitive archery tournament. Yeah, and that will be well timed. Uh, well, every, anything is well timed to just get out and shoot foam or whatever. But man, by the time this podcast drops, I bet you I'm sixty days, like sixty days out from my first hunt. Not my first yeah. hunt, I mean, but my first fall hunt. What do you call it? I mean, you can almost hunt year-round right now. Well, uh, there's always something to hunt, but not they're not, like, tagged seasons, right. right? So if you're looking at tagged seasons, yeah, your first one, your first ones in Washington are, like, August 1st, I think, is when we get our first one, which certain big areas game. for bear, for, for big, big game. game. Yeah, yeah well, that's But we I live right next to Idaho. About. We do, yeah. and Idaho's and you can hunt, antelope opens on the 15th. You can hunt cougar during the winter. Yeah, you can hunt cougar till like, March. You I can hunt right. bear from March or April until all the way through summer. 
in the fall. There's a there's a break. No, not, not there's units you can hunt bear in in July and August. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't looked at that. What what units are you talking about? Well, we don't talk about units on podcast really, but um, there are <laughs> there are units. Well, you didn't say you were hunting there. <laughs> yeah, I know, but Panhandle. Yeah, are you sure? Yep, I could have sworn it closed for like thirty to forty five days for bear. Yes. I was almost sure it did. I didn't think it was It open. might close from July until yeah. the middle of August or something. Yeah, I think it closes from July yeah. till early August or that something. That might be true. Or, or maybe even to September. Anyway. Or something in there, depending yeah. on where you're at. Doesn't matter. Um, but you can yeah. hunt almost... What I'm saying is you can hunt almost every month of the year if you want to. Just about, yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of wild. And then when you're not hunting, you can practice. <laughs> yeah. Which we like. We like shooting foam. Practice is good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about arrows today because you have strong opinions. And um, Mm -hmm. those opinions have been formed over, like, many years of, you know, time in the trenches or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I guess I should just give it to you and just say, like, can you can you prioritize a little bit of, like, the the importance of different parts of the arrow? Maybe what's where a person should start thinking about stuff and maybe later the things they might come back to. Well, as far as which piece or part is more relevant or more important? Yeah. yeah. Um, like if a person's coming to building their own arrows or well, maybe, I'd start, I'd maybe start creating by an saying, arrow build. I'd start by saying, well, are you prefacing this is an adult male, average size, average weight that we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Saying hunting so then Western big game. Typically. Let's say a Western big game hunter um, shooting past 20 yards at uh, which is important. 70 pound bow. It is. This yeah, is which relevant. is important you said that because it's... <laughs> You, you want to choose the tool that's right for what your application is. 100%. Right? So that and that's where I think so much of the internet keyboard warriors get into it with each other. Well, I'm using this. I'm using this. But they don't say, I'm using this for this. Here's why. Yeah. Because, you know, for someone who's hunting pigs in Florida, maybe they want something different than somebody who's hunting uh, mule deer in um, open country. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, and the guy hunting Rocky Mountain elk and the guy hunting white-tailed deer aren't hunting the same animal by no, any means. Not at all. So there's there's definitely some some relative difference there, and which is why I preface those questions yeah. like, who are we, who is this for, what's our application, right? Um, so at that point, I would I would start by saying I'm probably going to want average person somewhere between a 425 and a 475 grain setup. So basically, taking t- kind of taking the weight and reverse engineering. Yeah, that any, any arrow that any arrow combination that I build, any arrow combination that I build is probably going to have around fifteen percent forward to center, and there's a reason for that. The main reason for that is if you start playing with stuff at distance, yeah, you'll notice that if you have less than, oh, I'd say thirteen and a half, it starts to move around a lot more in the wind, and your groups tend to open up faster um, at distance. And if you get more than like 16 and a half, 17 percent, it really starts to drop like a stone at distance. Like it, it starts to tend to want to fly nose down. It doesn't maintain its level, in my opinion. Oh, interesting. I, I never um, heard your counter argument for like extreme FOC or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Th- there is a point where it's too much, in my opinion. Uh, I'm good all the way up to like 16 and a half, 17. So 13 and a half to 16 and a half is where I would put just about anybody for any application personally. Um, so I always try to stick at the 15. Somebody arguing for a lot of FOC, if they're hunting at 20, 30 yards, is that fine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, you're not going to see separation in those two things until you get out past, like, 70, 80, 90. Like you're, I mean, they're going to separate, but they're not going to separate as bad. It's not going to be as noticeable. Okay. Um, you'll start to see it drop a lot. And whenever I tried to to tune things and I got that heavier front weight in there, it just... It didn't seem to matter what I did as it got out there a ways it started to do that between the field point and the broadhead. They wouldn't stay together. Um, even using like dragged field points where they have the the resistance. So I was trying to give you an equivalent. It just seemed like that you got over that like 16 and a half percent and they didn't want to, they didn't want to do ideal things at any distance. Now, if you're going to shoot high, high FOC and you're keeping it at 40 and in, I don't think it's going to matter one little bit. You won't see a difference but you're not shooting far enough to see an accuracy difference, in my opinion. Anyway, almost anything's really accurate 40 and in. Like, you can shoot 7% FOC, 8% FOC, and if it's spined right and the bow's tuned right, it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Now, and if it's if you're running a hard wind at 40 yards, it's going to move more because there's not as much lead weight. 
Um, it's not going to penetrate as good because it's not being led by the tip anymore, and that changes things when you hit adverse objects. A lot of times when you're when you're hitting tissues or bones at an angle is where the front mass is really important. So if you're running 15, 16, 17% FOC and you hit at a quartering angle and you hit something hard, the ass end of the arrow is going to want to do that. It's going to try to push its way around it instead of push its way through it. And if you have more mass in the front, it's less likely to do that. So it's not just the weight, it's where the weight is and how much is there. That's really relevant. If you're even if you're going to run 700, 750 grain arrows, if you don't have at least 15% of the weight in the front and you hit something hard, the arrow is going to whip. It's not going to be driven by the front of the arrow. So there's there's a reason why I've always stuck in those parameters. Now, I've played outside of those parameters a lot. For sure. A lot. Like I built stuff for my cousin because he was a speed freak. He came from the rifle world and always shot really fast rifle stuff, yeah. like really ballistically coefficient tight flat shooting, like really, really, really big believer in that. So when we built his stuff, we built really light arrows, like lighter than I'd ever hunted with by a long shot. And we ended up building, um, at the extremes, close to 300 grain arrows with 100 grain tips. And actually, surprisingly, when you look at the percentages, it still had, you know, 13% or 14% That's FOC. It, with that light tip. Well, yeah, it's just frail. It's brittle, and there's no way around that. And it was very, very difficult to tune and keep tuned because it was finicky, but um, it, it absolutely worked. I mean, he killed half a dozen bull elk with 310, 320 grain arrows. Wow. Was he in pastors? Yes. Yeah. Dude, I watched him. The first, the first one we built, his, for his second year of bow hunting, it was his second year? Yeah, it was his second year of bow hunting. I watched him shoot a 250s, 260s bull at 85 yards. At 85 yards with a 320 grain arrow, got full pass what through, state was stuck was in a tree. In? Idaho. 320 grain arrow, full pass through, stuck in a tree behind it like that far. Like I had a hard time getting the arrow out Dang. of the tree. What kind of broadhead? Shuttle T lock. Okay. Which he still refuses to change from. <laughs> Well, but, I mean, it's a solid little fixed head. Uh, the, ever since they got... Um, oh, they changed ownership. They changed right? ownership, and when they changed ownership, they've had a lot of blade problems, mm. like a lot of blade problems. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if they're... I haven't dealt with that company in a little while. I don't even know if they're still around or kicking, but they probably are. But, but in any event, um, I'm getting off topic here. Um, 425 to 475 grain setup for the average person. I might veer a little lighter than that, but I'm also typically shooting more weight and longer draw length than the average person. So I have a little more built-up energy in my system, everything else being for equal. The, for the lighter poundage people, because we get a lot of these questions, hey, I have a 50-pound setup or 60-pound setup. Are we typically going to veer towards a higher arrow weight for them? No. No? No, there's there's reasons for that. Yeah. I'm still going to probably put them in a similar weight. I'm still They're still probably going to be 4 to 450 to 425 to 475, but the type of broadhead is going to be very, 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 very different. You can't just shoot whatever you want in that scenario. If you're shooting lower poundage, um, lower energy, like let's say you're shooting more of an entry-level bow, like uh, let's say an Infinite Edge 320 Diamond, right? They're not fast. They're 30 feet slower, 40 feet slower than what we are. You can probably throw that other one in there if you want. Um, yeah, so in that scenario, you're not producing as much energy, not nearly as much energy. So the type of broadhead that you use becomes super relevant at that point. And then it's a matter of how much do you want to spend. The more you spend, typically the uh, the harder the steel and the longer it'll stay sharp. Um, case in point, iron. Yeah, rolls. that's a good rule of thumb, right? Because you're paying for materials a lot. You're, you're paying for materials and uh, manufacturing variants. Yeah, I know. Like iron wheels are ridiculously expensive, but they're ridiculously ridiculously expensive to make. There's mm -hmm. a reason, right? You're you're paying a lot for those broadheads, but they're also the sharpest thing you can get. They will hold its sharpest sharpness the longest. There's other options out there that aren't nearly as expensive, but they're not going to be as sharp. And when you're talking about penetration, how sharp it is is hoop important. If you put all this stuff on a pedestal of value, right, and you're saying, okay, here's my arrow, here's 100%, right? What percentage of this arrow is going to contribute to penetration? What thing in here? 85% is the broadhead. Maybe 90 Right? It's mostly the broadhead, folks. It's not this ridiculously heavy arrow. It's what broadhead did you put on the front of it? 
And every time you add a blade, you add more resistance. So if you have a two-blade broadhead, it's going to penetrate drastically more than a three-blade broadhead. It's just going to. And then if you put a chisel point on the front of that three-blade broadhead, it's going to penetrate less than a lead cut three-blade broadhead or a blade that goes all the way to the front. And then if that chisel point isn't really sharp, it's going to penetrate even less. Like you looked at what we used to use 20, 30 years ago, and we never had penetration problems. And the arrows weren't that heavy. I mean, I was shooting light aluminum arrows, you know, 400, 450 grain aluminum arrows, and I'd sailed through everything I shot at and, and shooting bows that were 50 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet slower. What happened? It's all the broadhead. All of it. Like, nothing else is that different. I mean, yeah, we're shooting carbon arrows instead of aluminum arrows, so they don't bend. Okay, great. Everything about a carbon arrow should outperform an aluminum arrow in the penetration game. It's smaller in diameter, right? It's, it's got less wind resistance, less wind drag. It's got less drag when you're going through an animal. Like, when you cut with a standard broadhead and an aluminum arrow, the aluminum arrow was bigger than the ferrule. So it was dragging through the entire animal. Right. Even with a cut hole, the actual... The whole wedge that's going in there yeah. was smaller than the arrow. Every carbon arrow that you would hunt with today is smaller than the broadhead. Every one. Even like a standard 1960 force or 6.5 millimeter or whoever's jargon you want to use. Every single broadhead ferrule made is bigger than that. Just about. There might be a couple that are smaller. But in general, they run a broadhead ferrule at 5 sixteenths. Right, which is a larger diameter than every carbon arrow made. So the thing you're shoving through there first is bigger than the arrow. Now, granted, the smaller you get, the less drag there is, but all of them should have less drag. Every aluminum arrow used back in the day was bigger. Right. Yet, and, when you were and, and way slower. Yeah. And when you were shooting that, you were still sailing through it. Why were you sailing through it? Because your broadheads were longer than they are now, so they stretched out in length. So the cut ratio, i.e. how long is it versus how wide is it, was more proportionate to penetration, right? In an ideal world, it would be three to one, but you've got to shoot really heavy stuff to be three to one. Two to one's nice if you can get it. But the problem with that is it tends to be harder to stabilize. And that's where you run into the deviation away from that. They make these little short squatty things because they are easier to get to tune. Mm. That's, that's the logic, right? But everything you shot back in the day was long and skinny. Everything I started with when I was a kid, like 40-pound bow, 26-inch draw length, you know, 25-inch draw length, 420-grain arrows, sailed through everything I shot at. But I was shooting a two-blade broadhead that was really sharp, and I knew how to sharpen broadheads, and they didn't come sharp. You made them sharp. It's kind of wild how close, like, the traditional broadhead design that you would find fossils of is to uh -huh. is to actually being like a really amazing broadhead, right? One hundred percent. Yeah, like they they had that part pretty well damn figured out. They were trying to shoot through armor when you think about it, right? Yeah. Back in the day, and what did they make? Really long, long, skinny broadheads. I'd love to see a gravitation back towards that to some degree, but maybe experimenting with things that don't weigh so much, so you can make right. it longer, lighter materials, lighter materials that are still durable. You can make the whole thing a little longer because in, in, in a perfect world, and I think you're going to see this a lot more, you're going to start seeing glue and broadheads again, like full circle back to way back when, when everything was glued together, not screwed together. Because you're able to have more material with less Because you're weight. able to have more material in the broadhead with less weight, so you're still hitting that in in most most. I have a glue adult, in my broadheads. That doesn't bother me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when they, they didn't do it or they stopped doing it way back when. Especially people, hot melt or whatever. People wouldn't have two different sets of arrows. Like, they would hunt and practice with the exact same arrow. They would not have, these are my hunting arrows. These are the precious that I never touch, <laughs> right? And then these are the ones that I beat up all day long, right? They yeah. did not do that. Like, you used the same arrow. Like, you took the arrow that you were practicing with, and you screwed the tip off, and you screwed a broadhead on it, and you went hunting with the same arrow because people were cheap. They wouldn't, they wouldn't justify the money or the expense to have two different sets. I used to shoot, Muzzy made a bunch of glue-ins back in the day in the 90s. And I used those, and they, they were awesome. I shot my biggest mule deer with one of those. Um, and it was a 100-grain glues right on the arrow and doesn't come off, and you shot great. But I think you're going to see a lot more of that because you can put more of the mass in the front and still have a solid connection because the weak connection, the largest failure piece in yeah. anything is the insert. 
Yeah. Is the connection between whatever you screwed into it and what you screwed it into. Those two things are what cause most failures. And I don't think there's hardly anybody that'll argue so, that. So what materials are interesting if we're talking about lighter materials? Titanium and carbon. Titanium is incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard to bend and it weighs a lot less than steel, which if you look at my titanium insert, it's 50 grains. And my steel insert that's 100 grains is like just a little longer. Similar. Yeah, they're real similar. And yeah. steel's like twice as heavy as titanium. And what's the universal metal that they're using in really durable broadheads today is steel. Well, if you made it out of titanium instead of steel, that ferrule wouldn't weigh nearly as much. So I, I think you could A lot get, of the weight is in the ferrule. A good portion of yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually weighed it out, but I would say on a replaceable blade broadhead, you're probably talking at least three-fifths to three-quarters of the weights probably in the ferrule, the ferrule on the tip, and then the blades go into that. What's what's the difference in retail cost between the titanium insert and the steel insert? Uh, four dollars and seven fifty for me. So almost half. Yeah. Well, and my my amortized costs; those are the same percentages. In fact, yeah. I think I percentage I make less on the titanium as a percentage. I make more dollar, but I make a little less money on the titanium because I'm trying to keep it at a given price point. My my cost went up almost a dollar, and I only raised myself fifty cents because I still want it. I, it needs to be in that price. So let's say a person builds a broadhead that's made out of titanium. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be roughly double the cost ish. I would think there, there's titanium paying. ones out there. The severs are titanium. Yeah. And then if you look at a sever compared to um, you know an Ulmer Edge, the steel version of it was a ton smaller. Like it's it they the original Ulmer Edge was an aluminum ferrule broadhead with a uh, a chisel tip on it. For the kids listening at home, the Ulmer Edge and the Sever are basically the same broadhead. Uh, Trophy Taker made the Ulmer Edge for like four years or five years or somewhere in there, and before they sold the company, they stopped manufacturing it because they couldn't come to a an agreement on how much um, I think it's Rusty Ulmer, if I remember right, wanted of his percentage of it. Um, and then what they were trying to sell it for. So it just didn't seem viable, so they quit doing it. But that was, uh, they farmed that out to a bunch of different companies, and eventually Easton, who sells separate broadheads direct to consumer, um, took it on as their own little project, but went to a titanium ferrule. So you had a bigger, longer ferrule out of a really hard material, and it still weighs in at 100 grains. So um, Rage does the tripans. Those are titanium. Um, I know there's other ones out there. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but um, oh, there, man, are, there love, are a couple. I would love to see a big, long ferrule with a uh, three-blade fixed that mm -hmm. was long and skinny. Mm -hmm. Kind of like um, Valkyrie uh, Blood Eagles. Or the Valkyrie mm -hmm. design is very, very interesting to me. They seem like they'd be hard to sharpen, but... Something that's kind of yeah. that long and skinny triangle. Um, yeah, well, that's that's always the uh, the the appealing thing about a replaceable blade broadhead is you can get a sharp blade. Yes, because if you can take that blade off of the ferrule, it's a lot easier to sharpen. And Bill will tell you that when he's talking about why you you'll never he doesn't really want to make a three blade broadhead because he doesn't think he can make it nearly as sharp as his two or be as durable. But if you can't take the blade section off of the broadhead, you'll never get it as sharp. Because you can't get the right blade angle on it, because okay. the broadheads and the ferrules in the way when you're trying to sharpen it, I get you can't what get it. So yeah. that's part of why his system is so good, and why something where you can take the blade out is so good. But you're also running into an issue of now you've got multiple pieces and there's screws or things bolting them together. Whereas like a VPA or Valkyrie, which VPA makes Valkyrie's broadheads, they just have the straight blade version of them instead of the curved blood eagle or war or whatever they yeah. call it um they're they're made in the same place but they're same one manufacturing piece. Facility? yeah vpa makes that broadhead okay for valkyrie they make broadheads for several different companies out there that's the one i know of for positive but they i know they make a couple um but they uh they do all the machining out of one piece steel um, so vpa is good at machining stuff vpa knows how to one piece machine a broadhead they yeah. pioneered that from what i understand uh, they were the first guys making a legit machine, not m injection mem molded, <laughs> which would be your Montec design. Um, the shuttle T locks were molded for a long time. The blades are actually machined now, but they were molded broadhead. Uh, I want to say the the machining. The problem with molded is it softens the metal. 
Like you'll never get the metal to be nearly as hard, which means if it's not as hard, it's not as durable, it's more likely to bend. It's possible to have it bubble in the process that they that MEM does, and you could have little air pockets in there somewhere, little weak points. Um, so I, I don't... <laughs> nobody makes a knife that's molded metal. Why? Because it doesn't get sharp. So if you're shooting an injection molded broadhead, I would think twice about that choice. Uh, I won't. I won't name any others because I think everybody won't knows. Name names. I thought. I think everybody knows Montex are molded. I think it's pretty obvious, yeah. pretty blatant. Um, and I, I don't need to point any others out in the market. But that that's the main one that you, you could never get them sharp. I All mean, right. you can get them kind of sharp, but not really. And sharpness matters for a couple of reasons. One, if it's not cutting hair off your arm when you're testing it, it might not cut a vein or it might not cut an artery when it rolls by it when you're shooting into an animal. And it's definitely going to take a lot more force to penetrate through the hide and then through the hide on the other side. People get all fixated on, oh, shooting through the scap or shooting through a ribs. Like, get through the freaking hide. The hide is like leather armor. It is not the easiest thing to cut through, and so many people miss over the point of what touches it first is what's going to absorb the most resistance, which is why I love the Grim Reaper, because it is the sharpest chisel tip. I like a chisel tip because I feel a little safer hitting something hard that it's not going to break or it's not going to fold the tip over when you hit something. Right. But their tips on all their broadheads are super sharp. Like you can cut with the tip and you lose so much penetration, so much shooting a blunted, dull tip through hide. Getting through the hide is actually the hardest part, in my opinion. You hit a bone with enough force, it's going to break. And your broadhead's not made out of soft metals. If your broadhead's made out of soft metals, don't hit bones. They'll fold. And honestly, even still will. I shot a, I hit a scap of a, a mule deer with a, a mechanical broadhead last year on a follow up shot that folded the tip over. And it was all steel, but it was a long, skinny, ferrule about yay long before you ever got to a blade so there's no structural strength holding that up and it just folded over it still went in a long ways but it did fold it over and it was steel so yeah i just you gotta have a sharp tip getting through the hides the hardest part it really is you're not supposed to shoot them in the shoulder folks let's avoid that but they got hide on their entire body yeah everywhere you're gonna try to shoot that animal it's got hide which is hair and skin and they are hard to cut through it's amazing the amount of force it takes to cut through hide, especially elk. Elk have thicker, coarser hair and thicker skin. And the older they are, the thicker their skin is, Facts, it seems Jack. like. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I think we, we started talking about broadheads, but we started talking about lighter, lighter pounder setups. And basically the moral of that story was shoot a super sharp broadhead, right? Shoot a shoop, super sharp, a super elongated, sharp? <laughs> super sharp, elongated, two-blade. Two-blade. Yep. Okay. I would still shoot a two blade. Because we're maximizing penetration. We're maximizing penetration if we're worried about penetration. Yeah. And then in that scenario, I would also probably shoot a single bevel broadhead. Yeah. Because there is less resistance on a single bevel broadhead and I in think... almost anything you're going to put it in. VPA just came out with a nice 125 grain single bevel. That they The lightest thing they made in a single bevel before was a 150. Yeah. That's a real doable piece for that application. I'd, I'd look at that really hard. If you're going to a two blade, I think those single bevels are sweet, dude. The yeah. way they corkscrew. Mm -hmm. As long as your bevel grind and your fletch turns the same. Yeah. So now we're That's talking about complicated crap because now we're talking about, well, my arrow's turning left, so I need it to fletch left, and I need my my bevel to be left so yeah. when it hits, it's going the same direction. But you know what they're not doing? They're not reverse threading it because that's also left. Right. What a nightmare. I had somebody, I had a, 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 I don't know if a customer or a fan uh, ask how come nobody did that. I said, well, I agree. That really should be the case. But everything is the other way. And if this industry has shown you anything over time is whenever somebody comes up with a different attachment system, everyone refuses to adopt it. So great example, Deep Six. Loved it. Do you know what Deep Six is? Okay, the, the lack of reply probably says no. Do I know? Do you know what a Deep Six system is? Is that similar? No, I don't know. Okay, yeah. so... Uh, when Easton came out with the carbon injection arrow, which this is like seven, eight years ago, it was a steel insert that goes inside a 166. And then they made different broadheads and different field points to screw into it. 
right? I remember seeing those options like when you would buy a field point. Yeah, or you'd see in. deep six, right? Yep. Deep six, deep yep. six. Well, that was 640 thread. So like a standard field point is 832. Okay, that's what's on the back of your regular field point. It's what's on the back of your broadhead. It's 832. All inserts are 832. Everything has a universal shoulder height and depth that they're supposed to be manufactured at, so everything screws into everything, i.e., my field point screws into iron wheels insert, screws into so and so, glues into so and so zero. It's a it's a uniformity thing. Well, Easton came out with something called a 640, and then they partnered with New Archery Products, which was probably their first mistake for their broadheads when they first released them. So when they came out with this really cool new patented insert system that went into a 166 arrow, right? Internal completely, no shoulder, no big old adapter hanging out the end. Right, they didn't partner with more than one broadhead company, and every broadhead they released was an aluminum ferrule. And then you took twenty-five percent of the structural strength of the thread system out when you went to a six forty from an eight thirty-two. It's twenty-five percent smaller. You're not you're not going to hold up, right? And it there it took a couple years for broadhead companies to start making them. Which at the time there was an awful lot of mem broadheads or molded injection molded metal well that's a mold not a machine yeah so when you do that it costs a lot of money to make a different thread if it's cnc machined yeah, you just push some different buttons on the machine and screw out something different that's not a big deal but the most popular broadheads on the market several of them are molded so they weren't going to change it's so like well i can't afford to spend x just to make a threaded broadhead that goes into your system and the uh the Broadhead collar was unheard of back then, right? So not only did you reduce the the internal thread system, but you also didn't protect the end of the arrow. So if, you, if you've ever experienced this, and anybody who's been shooting bows a long time, has probably experienced the hit insert system that comes on an axis, the, the failure point is when you hit something hard, the field point goes right through the side of the arrow. Like it will fold and go right out because there's nothing holding it together. Because right, the insert's down in the arrow a quarter inch or so, or a half inch, somewhere around there, before it starts to thread. So there's a gap of carbon with no protection. If you put a collar over that, which is why Iron Will started making his collars, which he wasn't the originator of the collar, but he definitely does a phenomenal job of them. Um, but he came out with those so you could keep using a deep, or not deep six, a, a hit and protect it. Because you put a collar over the length that goes down inside the arrow before it yep. gets to the thread. Yep. Right? So you're protecting the ability for that point to go through the side. And it works. And it works quite well. I don't think you necessarily need to make them as long as he makes them for those applications. But either way, it does work. Well, that didn't exist. If you would have added that to the standard deep six system and steel broadheads, you'd be indestructible. And I think it would have taken off like wildfire. Because you can easily use a 166 arrow now without this gaudy adapter that sticks out the front. And you can and for, strengthen for what it's worth, the tip for yeah. a, a few grains. Like those yeah. titaniums are, yeah. what, 10, 15 grains or something? Yeah, like uh, my titanium 204 colors weigh 15 grains. Yeah. It's, you're not adding a lot of weight to do it. Yep. Um, and that's for a, a 204. You can make it for a 166 and it will probably weigh a little less yet. But if you if you had that in, a, in conjunction, but we've kind of passed it. That's the problem. It's like Easton doesn't even offer an arrow with that insert in its stock anymore um i used to i i used to use uh vaps victory vaps and that insert and muzzy montex i'm not the muzzy trocar sorry not montex because uh, it was a steel ferrule it was a offset blade so it's corkscrewed when it hit stuff it was still a double bevel grind so you still got a good traditional sharpness to it um, but it would twist when it hit tissue and they twisted right so you fletched right back then but i i'd glued deep six inserts in them i think i, I might have been the largest purchaser of deep six <laughs> inserts yeah. for two years or three years straight yeah and sold a ton of those but when broadhead manufacturers didn't all jump on board it kind of screwed the system you know it's almost like i get that easton wanted to patent their own system but it would have been nicer if maybe you just allowed everybody to use it and maybe not made it expensive so it will get adopted because you just basically gave everybody else that makes arrows a reason to say that sucks instead of saying, hey, yeah, you can use it too. That would have been smarter. Um, and the only the one thing that did come from it is um, Iron Will's Snyder core system. Yep. It uses a deep six thread. Now they That's made what the, I thought it was, yeah. They made their own. Well, it's longer though. So they glued it farther down on the arrow. 
So if you look at it, like if you look at the iron wheel, the thread shank's like that long instead of that long. Like this is a normal thread shank, right? Those are the only ones that you still kind of see around. Um, and th they probably had to do that because of a patent deal or? Uh, no, um, Iron, Iron Will licenses the HIT okay. technology from Easton. Like he pays to use their stuff. But he rather than make a straight deep six, because almost nobody makes it, it's not, it's not going to be a deterrent to make yours different. Right. It's not like you're, well, but he already has this insert. It's like, no, you got to use his insert, his broadhead, the whole shebang is only him. Um, so I get why he did it that way. But I really wish that would have gone a little differently because I was a really big fan of that system, even without the collar. And a collar would have made it about bomb proof. So you could easily use a 166 and it wouldn't have been a burden. But because all the broadhead manufacturers went away from it, like, I only think there's three that even make one anymore. Like, um, Grim Reaper was still making them. I still have some hanging on the wall, but I I, I want to say I talked to Matt just last month, and he said, "Yeah, we we don't even we're not packaging up more of those. We're we're we've burned through the ferals. When the ferals are gone, they're done. We're not making more." Um, Muzzy doesn't make any. Uh, I'm trying to think who still even makes one. Some of the machine smaller machine companies will still make them because they can just push different buttons on their machine and they're making broadheads. But Grim Reaper used to still make like two or three. They'd only make it out of steel ones too. They wouldn't make it out of aluminum ones because that was the the sticky thing. There were still a lot of aluminum broadheads in the market. I mean, there still is now, but there was way more back then. And I think the broadhead manufacturers knew this isn't going to hold up. So either we make it out of steel or we don't make it. Or titanium, which nobody was even playing with titanium then. Or I shouldn't say nobody, but almost nobody. Well, I like that idea of using titanium. So we got off the tracks a little bit there, and that's cool. I, I have we, a tendency. That was that was good though. <laughs> that was all very interesting stuff. Like it sounded like a new technology came to market, but it was cornholed off in a way that there couldn't have, the adoption wasn't wide enough to yeah. to get it to hit the the threshold for adoption or whatever yeah and you still think it was a valid idea right uh yeah the only the only way it's going to functionally work is if there's good broadheads right I feel like i need to sneeze Oof. <laughs> yeah yeah it's coming it's coming wait for it nope it's gone um but we talked about arrow weight arrow weight's important broadhead sharpness is important uh forward of center is important you like fifteen percent, thirteen to seventeen percent is a good range. Yep. Uh, what, what what other stuff should people be spending their brain energy on? Those are the majors, right? Yeah, the majors. I mean, if you if you had to factor Arrow it up, broadhead into, sharpness. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, dude, like I said, eighty five percent of it's the broadhead. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a, I, I hate I hate to say this, but if you have a two hundred dollar budget, and you're not spending at least half of that on your broadheads, you're selling yourself really short. Like the broadhead is so much of it. So much of it. And what it's also the most common thing for somebody to change. Yeah. Like people change broadheads like their underwear, damn near. I mean, it's like every every year a guy's got a new broadhead because he it didn't work like I thought it should have. So it's the broadhead's fault. And yeah. I'm getting a new broadhead. It's really common, but there's not that many choices out there that are constructed in a manner that are gonna penetrate. One of like the hard things stuff. about broadhead shopping though is like and maybe this was my arrow not being tuned to the broadhead, but I was broadhead tuned, but when I when I went through and shot like sets of fixed heads, mm -hmm. they don't all fly the same. So is that tuning to the particular head, or is it just not all broadheads <laughs> fly the same? Were they spinning straight out of the arrow? Did Good you question. check? Yeah, spin you, them on if, the spinner. If your answer to that is I don't know, yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah, because they're they're not always going to be perfect, and that's why you check them. Like you, the ASD flip, that's not just for facing the. Uh, the arrow it's also for facing the insert like you get if you screw it all together and, and you're trying to make everything perfect right you screw you you square the face of your arrow before you glue your insert in and then i'll screw i'll, I'll weigh out my arrows and i'll weigh out my broadheads and try to match up the weights because they're all going to be a little different like the lightest arrow with the heaviest broadhead and the heaviest arrow with the lightest broadhead and vice versa which i've i've put stuff on instagram and i've done a couple of videos of how to you know, put these things together so they're closer, as close as you can get them. And then um, ooh, the, uh, sorry, I just had a brain fart. Um, yeah, getting, getting the weights to match and then spin them. Like take a basic spinner, yep. put your arrow on it, put a piece of white paper behind it so you can see it, put a dot on the paper so you can line the tip up with the dot and spin it. 
does the tip stay on that dot or does it move off that dot? And this is where single bevel sucks because it's hard to find the center spinning point of a single bevel because it doesn't come to a point. It usually comes to a flat. And so it's hard to tell when that thing's perfectly straight. But if that broadhead is not spinning like a top, like perfectly straight, when you shoot it, it's going to deviate a little bit because mm -hmm. the, the force of the wind coming at it because of how fast it's trying to cut through the wind, if it's not perfectly straight, it's going to deviate. I guarantee you that's why they didn't seem to shoot in the same spot. And it doesn't take much. And nine times out of ten, when you screw one together and it doesn't go on perfectly straight, you unscrew it, you face the insert with the ASD, run it over it, run it over it, run it over it, screw the broadhead back in. Nine times out of ten, now it spins. And then once out of ten, that broadhead's crooked. So And that's a hard thing to fix. Most fixed broadheads, you're saying, then will will shoot fairly well out of a tuned tuned setup that spin well. Oh, yeah. like if The setup's tuned, the arrow yeah. spins well, the broadheads if, will shoot well. If that thing doesn't spin straight, it ain't going to yeah. fly right. If it does spin straight, I'd be shocked if they don't group. Because, man, I don't want to trash talk broadheads right now, but I, I, I at, at a point, tested four or five sets of fixed, mm -hmm. and a couple of them shot well. The traditional ones that we know shoot well, like the Grim Reaper Micro Hades. And then some of the You rarely find designs, crooked ones of those. What's that? You rarely find crooked ones of those. Yeah. So that's another reason why I recommend them a lot and talk about them a lot. So I rarely ever I mean, find I'm one talking, I'm not talking point of impact as much as talking group size. Like, oh, yeah. My group size expanded pretty considerably with some other broadhead sets. So there are, not going to name names. Yeah, we can. All right. No, I'm not going to. Okay. But there are some broadheads on the market that I would throw every other one away when I'd check them. They're so crooked, there's no way it's going to fly straight. Yeah. Nothing you can do. Like I, And they're big names that have been around a long time. Um, some of their construction, like especially when they start going to China or start importing their product instead of making their well, product here. it's one here, of those things where you get what you pay for, too. Like, yeah. You're not going to yeah. get the cheapest, sharpest, best flying broadhead. Those things aren't going to go together. No, that's why I said it should be more than half of your expense should be in your broadhead because when you buy cheap broadheads, they suck. Wow. They don't fly straight. They don't spin straight. You throw half of them away because they won't group where the other ones do. And you can go through the... The painstaking process of just screwing all that stuff together and going shooting it and figure out which ones shoot and which ones don't. Or you can spin them and throw away the ones that don't spin. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're spending $50 a three, $60 a three, those things better spin. And if they don't spin, you might want to think twice about who's brought it you're buying at that point. If you screw those on and you are and you know your arrow's square and straight, like you put a field point in it and spin it, because you can do the same thing with your field points, Put a field point in the end of that thing and spin it. Does it spin straight or does it wobble? Right. If you if you know your inserts in there square, then that means you screw your broadhead in and all of a sudden it doesn't spin square. It's your broadhead. It's so important. Those little tiny, little tiny deviations make drastic differences. It's the difference between being able to shoot 40 yards and being able to shoot 100 yards. I mean, if those things aren't coming out like a top, they're going to shoot like crap. It makes sense to me why for so long people, people have steered away from fixed broadheads because there's there's so much to know about tuning and then like arrow nuance to really get them to fly. Sure. When the the easy button is just hey, let me strap on this uh you know, big mechanical that yeah, flies. Yeah, but is that a be easy button cuz if cuz if it's then not Then you don't know your setup as well, right? Exactly. Like yeah. that's that's the big hiccup. Like is is your broad is your fixed blade broadhead not shooting because it's not straight out of your arrow, or is your fixed blade broadhead not shooting because your bow's tuned in correctly? Exactly. If your bow's tuned in correctly, you are not transferring energy downrange accurately and efficiently, folks. You are not hitting with the poundage and the force and yep. the kinetic that you're supposed to be hitting with, and you are being irresponsible. You that need that arrow needs to leave your bow straight, and if your method of doing that is cutting down your arrow till it shoots around your bow. Fine, <laughs> yeah. but you better be doing that. Yeah. Like, but I'd rather see you tune your bow correctly and which understand why, and learn how to tune your bow correctly. And which is why you've always said, "Hey, you can go ahead and shoot bare shafts, or you can just strap a big old broadhead on the front." That's the reality of the difference. I I get bare shaft tuning. Yeah. And why I've done it, I've done it a lot. Okay, but I've only ever done it on my target bows because I'm never shooting a broadhead out of my target bows. But I will always tune my bow with fixed blade broadhead. Always. And I guarantee you, like, build your bow, try your shaft tune, shoot your shaft once, and if your shaft, like, takes off, like, a foot different from where your field point impacts at 20 yards, do me a favor. 
Grab your fixed blade broadhead on that Fletch Darrow and screw it on there and tell me where your broadhead went. This is your homework. It went right where your freaking shaft went. Yeah. So if if at the end of the day, the goal is to get your broadhead and your field point to hit in the same spot, shaft tuning is not relevant. Broadhead tuning is relevant. You can skip that step. Unless... Because understand, they are the same freaking step. <laughs> yeah. It's the same step. That's you just might as say. well use the tool that you're going to hunt with in the step instead of this fictitious thing that you're never going <laughs> to shoot at an animal. But if you are if you have a lot of time and you want that redundancy, it's a redundancy, right? You're going to end up in the same place. Exactly. So it's a redundant step. It, 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 as long as you're using fixed blade. If you're using mechanical now, you're not going to see it. Yeah. You're not going to see it as much. You're still going to see it, but it's going to be less. Yeah. So it's harder to notice. So if you're if you're just going to strictly shoot mechanical, like certain people that really like to shaft tune, pretty much shoot mechanical. I get it because you're not going to see it. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to shoot fixed blade broadheads, there is no reason to do that. You shoot your broadhead. You see where your broadhead goes in relation to your field point, and you take the same steps of movement and the same changes of movement to get them to hit in the same spot. You're doing the same thing. You're just doing it with the actual tool you're going to hunt with. So why add that? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It just, yeah, doesn't, it just I, doesn't. I'm with you. I mean, I, I get it. Uh, people still do it, but I think th- those people, if they know this and they go out and experiment, because most people that do one thing and preach one thing, mm. they haven't often experimented with the other. Yeah. I need, I need to preface by saying you yeah. don't need to do that. If you're going to broadhead tune with fixed blade broad heads. Yeah. Okay. That's when you don't need to shaft tune. Yeah, we always call that skipping the foreplay, right? Yeah. You don't need to bear shaft tune when you can just broadhead tune. Yes, and that still holds true 100%. Like, okay, now, it really does. One thing we have to say on the podcast, and I'm sure you're going to make many wonderful videos about tuning. Mm, okay, yes, sir. If I shoot my fuel point mm-hmm. and my fuel point hits near the center, mm-hmm. and then my fixed head mm-hmm. shoots to the right, mm-hmm. which direction do I move my rest? Well, you need to figure out why it's hitting right before you just say, I'm going to move my rest. Okay. Now, typically, I would move my broadhead toward my field point. So you're, if you're a right-handed shooter, right, you'd move your arrow rest to the left. To the left, yeah. Because whatever the field point, whatever the broadhead is doing, the field point's doing too, the broadhead just shows it more. So if you strike the target with your, fletch, with your, with your field point in the middle and you hit to the right, they're both actually pointed to the right. So you're trying to push it back to the center. Uh, you can also move your cams to try to manipulate that instead of your arrow rest. So that's why I try to use a broadhead, not a shaft. The other the other thing I should point out with doing shaft tuning is if your bow's out of whack enough that your shaft's not going to fly very good, you'll probably break your shaft the first time you try to shoot it at like 20 yards to see how it's striking a target if it's not really good. So that's the other reason where if you at least have fletches on the back of a broadheaded arrow, it won't snap the arrow in half. Sure. won't break an arrow. But... Yeah, that's that's your movement for that. Although a right impact with a fixed blade broadhead or a shaft can also indicate a weak spine arrow. Okay, so if your arrow's not stiff enough for what you're trying to do, that's where it's going. It's to the right, and it's probably going low out of almost any application. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, and the internet always comes to... F- there's like... Whenever we talk about this rest and point of impact, the internet always strikes back with there's a group that argues for the opposite. Mm-hmm. That group, what, what are they? Do they just are they misunderstanding their tune, or are they trying to get? What are they? Wh- why is that? Do you know? Can you make their argument? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just just try it. Like, like, I have I seen it go the other way? Yeah, not very often. Yeah. And traditionally, it's usually because it's not spined correctly. And when I build a bow, it's going to have the right spine arrows in it. And if we were moving our cams. We're, we're moving our cams towards the broadhead or away from it? So if you have a right strike, um, you'd, you'd try to... Oh, give me a second here. You'd add lean, so you'd move the cams to the left, if I remember correctly. Same direction we would move the rest. Yeah, if I remember correctly, yeah. 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 But I'm going to yeah. do a full breakdown video where I deliberately do it. Right. So, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to move this this way. What happens? We're going to move this that way. What happens? And we're going to do... A bare shaft test. And we're going to do a broadhead tune and say, okay, I'm going to deliberately move my rest to the right. What happened? Mm-hmm. Where'd my field point go? Where'd my broadhead go? And show it step by step so we can stop arguing about it. Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, but anytime, anytime I've ever tried to tune a broadhead, I've always moved the arrow, the broadhead toward the field point with the arrow rest. But I have found in a lot of instances that that it they frequently will move the same amount, or it will decrease but not get perfect. And then you're running into a wheeling issue, or you're running into a spine issue. And there's ways to check those things. Like if you think it's spine and you think it's too weak, back your poundage down. Did it get better? Did it improve? That doesn't cost anything to do that. And you can just turn your poundage right back up after you try it. Yeah, no risk, right? There's no risk. There's no, it doesn't, it's not like you got to buy a different arrow. It's like you got to cut down an existing arrow to yep. try to make it stiffer. You know, it's not, you, know, you got to put a different point in the arrow, which you can also do that. You can stiffen your arrows by taking tip weight out and adding a little less tip weight. And then it'll make the arrow stiffer, and then you'll get a different reaction. But there's, I'm, I'm working on a whole big long series of step by step for all these things. So there's a, a catalog on YouTube to go back and check all this stuff over time that'll just sit there forever. So anybody that wants to know how to do it and wants to play with it can play with it. I like it. I'm subscribed for that. <laughs> Sign me up. Hopefully, hopefully, do like one a week. And there's just, there's just so much. You know, it's hard to prioritize what's more important. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah, I get it. Well, what a great deal. Fire's out. Was that an hour? That's an hour. God, I thought we have been talking for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, That's so we were, weird. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about your jam today. We were talking uh, about yeah. arrow tuning, arrow right, setup. Right in my passionate wheelhouse. You don't need 800 grain arrows, although they're fun to have or whatever. Hey, you know, I, I've, I've said it 100 times. You're going to shoot stuff at 20 yards. That's a cool setup. Because honestly, you're both quieter. Yeah. You could probably shoot just about any angle and you're probably going to go through. Unless stuff. you shoot one of those short squatty broadheads, then you're probably not going through because when they're building for those things, they're also shooting a traditional style broadhead. I mean, I think you can shoot that traditional style broadhead with 420 grains and you're probably going to go right through the same thing as long as it's the same spine. Has to be a fair comparison. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of times when you see these tests, they're not fair comparisons. So I'm going to do my best to show you actual fair comparisons and what really happens i like it the mad scientist is at work we got some cool mad scientist stuff coming I'll, yeah i wonder if we'll ever this, run out we of got weird, this super fast yeah. bow build we got to do yeah yeah i wonder if i'll ever run out of things to do like i that. don't think so when you combine your ideas with what the internet will propose and give us ideas for i think there's yeah lots of possibilities yeah, there's always somebody telling telling you how dumb you are to make a video about and it. And be subscribed, guys. Like, uh, yeah. uh, we got to get this channel to 5K. That was our initial ask. Yeah, come on, step it up, guys. 5K we, we, is fair. We're, we're still doing this for you because you it's we a know free you hey, want look it. Around. This is a free podcast. Like, this is Josh and Tim. Josh has edited some of these, right? Yeah, which I hate. We're not like. <laughs> <laughs> I have to edit this one too. We're not Ugh. like meat eater. Like, look around. Do you, do you see a production group? No. No. It's two dudes with a just, camera and some sound equipment. Two dudes and a camera. And like a little bit of caffeine. A little bit of caffeine and like two grand worth of audio equipment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, guys, um, appreciate the the listen. We'll uh, we'll catch you back for the next one. See you later. We're not meat eater. Look at this little <sighs> team we got. Yeah. Little tiny team trying to put out content. Oh. Yup.